Okay, good evening. I hope everybody's doing well. My name is Matthew Rothfuss. I'm with the Bethlehem Area Public Library, uh, and we're running the Zoom tonight. Um, first off, I want to thank Harold Burns with the Bethlehem Food Co-op, um, who has organized this series. I believe this is our third year now of organizing a winter webinar series focused on local and sustainability in Bethlehem and the greater Bethlehem area. Uh, just as a reminder, the first uh, session, uh, which was last month in December, is on our YouTube channel, the Bethlehem Area Public Library's YouTube channel. Uh, and if you are uh, interested in the climate challenge uh, after tonight's program, we do have extensive amounts of resources uh, at the library, as well as a dedicated display on the climate challenge. So come on on down to the library. Um, so um, without further ado, I wanted to uh, welcome Kelly Gibson, who is the Impact Strategy Consultant and World Wildlife Fund's Innovation Impact Measurement Lead. Thank you so much, Kelly, for joining us tonight. Well, thanks, Matthew, and thank you, everyone, for joining on this rainy night. Like Matthew said, I hope you're staying warm and dry, and uh, it's nice that we can be doing this remotely from somewhere at home, hopefully. Uh, but yeah, it's really great to, to be here. So as Matthew said, I'm Kaylee. I, first and foremost, I'm a member of the Bethlehem Food Co-op. I live in Bethlehem. I uh, am at the library quite often taking out books, so it's exciting to be here. Uh, with both of those organizations. And as Matthew said, uh, professionally, a lot of what I do is helping businesses and organizations measure and manage their social and environmental impact and doing that in innovative ways. And that includes the environment. So the topic tonight is really dear to me professionally, but also personally with what my personal values are and what I'm trying to do in my own home. So um, although I'm sharing these things with you tonight, please know I'm not necessarily an expert in all of them. And I am kind of struggling along with all of you and trying to, to reduce my own carbon footprint. So yeah, welcome again. And how we're going to spend our time, we have about an hour. So I am going to start with kind of taking a step back. I'm sure all of us had a busy day. So I'm going to take a step back to remind us of kind of the larger picture of why greenhouse gas emissions and the climate challenge our important topics. And then I'll do a little bit of uh, greenhouse gas emissions 101. Some of you might be familiar with the terms that are thrown out when it comes to carbon and uh, measuring our greenhouse gas emissions, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page and have a shared vocabulary. And then from there, I'll get into kind of really practical stuff that we can do in our personal lives and at home related to our carbon footprint. And then I'm hoping to leave time for plenty of, if you have questions, or I'm sure many of you might have things to share with the group of things that you're doing on your own. So we'll we'll do that at the end. But I will say, if you have a question as I'm going, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, I might answer it as we go, or it might come up later. So if you don't want to forget, put it in there and we'll get to it at some point. So to kick us off, I... Uh, want to share this picture. It's called the pale blue dot. If anyone has heard of this or seen this before, maybe just put it in the chat if you have. Um, this is an image that was taken on the 14th of February, 1990 on Voyager 1. And I don't know if you can see it, but this tiny little dot here is actually the Earth. And this picture was uh, taken and was inspired by when the Voyager was leaving the atmosphere and they took an image on its kind of reflection back to Earth. Carl Sagan is kind of famous for directing this image. And uh, what I wanna share with you is a little bit of his reflection of this. But just some stats, when this image was taken, Voyager 1 was 4 billion miles away from Earth, approximately uh, 32 degrees from our plane, and the picture that you're looking at right now, it's 0.12 pixel in size. So it's quite small. And the way, the reason why you're looking at it in that kind of light ray is because of how close it was to the sun at that point. 
So what I'm going to do is just share a quick like three minute video of an excerpt that Carl wrote in a reflection and inspired by this image. Uh, I'd encourage you, there's going to be just some general images as you hear the speaker uh, sharing some of Carl's words. So you can watch that if you want to close your eyes and just listen. But let this be just a three minute grounding exercise. Take a deep breath and remind us why this work's important. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. So I love that because I think it's beautifully written, but also puts a little bit in perspective of us in the universe and how precious the earth is that we live on and kind of how unique it is that it allows us to live uh, and puts it into perspective kind of day to day. So I zoomed out a lot there just for a moment. Hopefully that was a little relaxing too. And now I'm gonna zoom actually really close in to Bethlehem or wherever you are today and uh, talk a little bit about kind of our role in taking care of the pale blue dot and making sure that it's a place that we and future generations can flourish. So Matt already mentioned about the um, climate challenge, but if you aren't familiar with it, there's a QR code you're welcome to scan and we'll make sure that we share these slides afterwards. But the climate challenge has a lot of great stuff in it, but one of the overall goals that we have in Bethlehem as a community is to be net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2040. 
I'm going to explain what net zero actually even means in a moment, but it's very relevant to what I'm going to share today because reducing our own carbon emissions contributes to this wider goal. And the climate challenge has a lot of great options for you to take towards those goals. Um, I listed a couple of them that were relevant here below, and a lot of them are going to be shared tonight. So if you are interested in that challenge, I'd encourage you to check it out. And hopefully tonight we'll give you some additional resources that you need to uh, choose one of those options or multiple options. The Bethlehem Co-op has joined and we have a couple of our own specific um, options that we're working towards. I personally have done it as well. And I think it's just a great way to uh, encourage us and have some accountability as a community. If you're not in Bethlehem, that's okay. You know, you can still use this, I think, uh, for your own inspiration and you're welcome to choose a challenge yourself and do it. So let's dive in now. And like I said at the beginning, I think it's really important to have a shared language when it comes to some of these terms that you see thrown around in the news or um, online. And I think sometimes we forget to actually define what some of these things are. So this might be a refresher for some and for others, hopefully this will kind of unveil what sounds like some confusing terms. But today we're gonna talk a lot about greenhouse gas emissions. You might see GHG as an acronym for that. And at a high level, greenhouse gas emissions are certain gases in our Earth's atmosphere that have the ability to trap heat. So it's kind of like think of a blanket around the Earth. It keeps us warm enough so that we can live. Um, the greenhouse gas effect is, is that warming effect that happens with those gases. And some of those gases are like carbon dioxide, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide. And so we want that to happen. But what's occurred is that human activities such as driving our cars and burning fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, cutting down trees, having big industry, all of these are releasing gases and at a speed that we actually have too much of them. So think of the earth having like, you know, 12 blankets on it, it's too hot. And we need to figure out a way to get back to the levels that are healthy for us to be able to live. So reducing our greenhouse gas emissions is really crucial when we talk about climate change. On the right here is just a picture to show you as a globe where the carbon emissions are coming from. You can see the US plays a huge role there. We have 13 and a half percent. China is the only country that's higher than us. So we definitely have a role to play as a country and individually when it comes to thinking about reduction. Bringing it a little closer to home, this is how uh, it breaks down in the US specifically. So if you think about where the greenhouse gas emissions are coming from, you can see transportation, is the highest there, residential is 6%. So today we are a smaller piece of the bigger puzzle, but we're still an important one. And we all buy things. So when it comes to commercial or agriculture industry, we can vote with our dollar and kind of choose how we are trying to reduce it in those areas. And you can see carbon dioxide is the biggest gas that's being released when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. So hopefully now you kind of know what that term means. These are some other buzzwords and kind of scientific words you're gonna see thrown out. Carbon neutral, net zero, climate positive. I already mentioned net zero when it comes to the Bethlehem Climate Challenge. And these terms I see misused all the time online. So you wanna be careful. I'd encourage you when you're reading certain um, information about this to look at your sources. So the UN, uh, is a great one, uh, or any kind of government website or EPA. But essentially, these are all related because they're all different terms that relate to reducing carbon emissions in some way, but they're also quite different. So I want to spend a quick moment explaining this. This is the driest part, and then we'll kind of get to the more practical. But carbon neutral is a state where your carbon emissions are equal to zero. So it's kind of like a balancing act, as you can see in this picture here. So for carbon, you would basically figure out what your carbon emissions are, and then you'd figure out how you remove them from the atmosphere. But you can do that by buying what's called carbon offsets. This is when you purchase uh, offsets, you're contributing to a conservation project anywhere in the globe that's maybe planting trees. So you don't actually reduce your carbon, 
but you're kind of offsetting it by supporting these conservation projects. That's a good place to start, but where we're at in the world is we really need to be thinking about net zero. And that, the biggest difference in net zero, it's actually about action and reduction of your emissions in the first place. So to be net zero, you're reducing your carbon by at least 90%. So that's culture change. It's, it's actually figuring out how you don't emit them in the first place. There's not offsetting unless it's the last resort. So it can be a big difference. You can be carbon neutral without changing anything that you're doing. But to be net zero, it takes a lot of effort. And that's what we're aiming for. So today it's all about action because we're aiming to actually reduce our emissions. And climate positive is above and beyond that. That's when you're net zero and you figured out ways to make positive contributions to the environment. But tonight we're just gonna focus on net zero and that's a, a good kind of place to have a goal. Uh, when it comes to carbon emissions, there's three different types, uh, scope one, scope two, and scope three. These are other things that you may hear when, uh, you know, in the news about carbon. And often these are talked about with businesses. So you might see the word company. Uh, for us, we're going to think about household. So think of our household as kind of our own little operating uh, business in a way. So scope one is the biggest emitter of emissions. And scope three is the smallest, but they're all really important. Scope one, also known as burn, are the types of fuels that we are directly burning and putting into the atmosphere. So if you have a boiler at home, uh, that would be scope one. You're buying oil and it's you're burning it in your home for heat, and that's putting out there for, for industry or for manufacturing. Scope one is really big. If you own a car or a lawnmower or a snowblower, anything that you maybe are putting gasoline into or some kind of fuel into, that's also scope one. Scope two is also known as buy. So these are a bit more indirect. So if you don't own your home, say you're in an apartment or you're um, leasing your, your home, um, you're renting your home, you are still paying for heating and cooling, but that is not direct. You don't own those and you're not burning it yourself. Purchase electricity also is scope two. Uh, so if you have a home, whether you own it or you rent it, you're going to have scope one or two or a mixture of the two. And then finally, scope three is kind of everything else. It's beyond. These are all the things we're buying. So the clothes we wear, the food we eat, the furniture we have, the hairdresser we go to, all of these things are in scope three. So there is an impact for us choosing to buy something and then disposing of it. So you'll hear terms called upstream and downstream. Upstream is when you kind of get that item, everything that happened to get it to you, the trucks that it took to transport the item that you purchased, and downstream is what you do to it when you throw it away. So all of that is calculated when it comes to your greenhouse gas. I should also mention that travel, like planes, transportation of any sorts is also in scope three, if it's not your own vehicle. And then here's just another image. I like showing it in two different ways. Sometimes this is helpful for understanding. Same thing, scope one and two is kind of more about the building, your home itself, and scope three is about your day-to-day -day kind of practices and things that you're buying or your lifestyle. So we're gonna talk about all three scopes today and uh, you'll kind of learn ways to reduce all of them. Now, before we talk about reduction, uh, it's really hard to reduce something before um, you know what you have to begin with. So you need some type of baseline to say, all right, this is what my footprint is today. And then a year from now or six months from now, I can check, did I reduce it? But if you don't measure it, it's hard to know if you're meeting those goals. So there's some really neat carbon footprints for households and individuals out there. They're free. This is one of my favorite ones. Again, we'll send the link out or you can use the QR code. This is put out by the Nature Conservancy. And it's a pretty quick interactive calculator. It takes you through things like how big's your house, who's living in your house, do you have children, do you have pets, do you own a vehicle? Um, you can get specific, you can kind of choose to drill down or you can kind of have a high level estimate. It, you know, I did it and it said, okay, what, um, what kind of car do you have? What's the make and model? What year? It asked me about insulation in my house and what year my house is. So you can kind of drill down or you can do high level, but what it spits out for you 
is what your household what your household um, emissions would be for the year. So this is what mine looked like. I did a quick estimate. So it will tell you your tons of CO2 per year, your footprint. It will tell you how you compare to the average, like someone who lives in a similar size home, similar lifestyle. And then you can see where your footprint is. So for me, I can see my home makes up a good amount of my footprint. I'm guessing because I live in an older home that could definitely use new windows and better insulation. And while we do have renewable electricity, we have gas for heating and cooking. So this kind of gives you an idea of where it's coming from and it will give you some suggestions for how you can decrease it. But this is free and you can do it as often as you want and you can see how your actions actually change this over time. So I would really encourage you all to check this out. There's lots of footprints uh, calculators out there. And with that, that was a lot of information really quickly, and that was the technical stuff. So I just encourage you to take a deep breath. And um, at this point, if you have any questions around that, like feel free to put it in the chat. Um, what I'm going to switch to for the second half is once we kind of know what our footprint is, what are some practical things we can to, to do to reduce it? So I'll take my own deep breath, and um, we'll jump in. Okay, so we're gonna start with looking at our home. So again, if you rent or own, you still have emissions. And we're gonna specifically look at energy efficiency and the role of renewable energy when it comes to reducing emissions. So the first one we will look at is energy efficiency. And some, a lot of these are not new things, honestly, but it's good to remember that these actions and changes will directly affect that footprint of yours. So when it comes to energy efficiency, this is we're thinking of the lighting that we have, the appliances we own, um, cooling and heating in our home. So one of the first things that you can do, you know, that I think we've been doing for years is thinking about your light bulbs switching out to LED to save energy and reduce emissions. Uh, spoiler alert, a lot of these actions actually also will save you money over time. Some of them do have a investment early on, but if you can reduce the amount of energy you're using, your bill's gonna be lower. So I like to mention that. Uh, second thing to think about is smart thermostats or energy efficient appliances. So using a thermostat so you can control and put it on a schedule of when your heat's coming on or when it's not, for example, um, or uh, even automatic timers for lights or motion activated. I know I work um, from home, so in the morning when the sun's not up, I have my lights on and sometimes I start working and realize the lights go on. So it's little things like that that you can kind of come up with smart solutions. Energy efficient appliances. So you could look for the Energy Star certification. That's a good way of knowing that that appliance has met certain standards. So if you are in the need of a new fridge or something, you know, do some research and make sure you're picking a better option. Insulating your home, that can really conserve energy and reduce your heating and cooling emissions, but also costs. And then uh, conduct an energy audit, which is actually one option for the climate challenge. I'll talk a little bit more about this, but this is usually a free service that your energy provider allows for you. And it will kind of help you pinpoint where you might have options to reduce energy and efficiencies. And then the last one, it's just, Turn off the lights, rely on natural light if you can. Um, if you live with other people in your home or kids, you know, trying to come up with a way that this is just part of your household and what you do. For each of these, I have one really practical example. So uh, I think most of us probably have PPL or, or MedEd for our distributor for electricity. So um, this is an example of PPL, that's who I have. If you log on to your account, they offer a no cost virtual home energy assessment, it's 30 minutes. Uh, it'll help kind of looking at your bill and where, what kind of home you have, give you some suggestions on how you can reduce that. And then they also send you a free energy saving kit. So they'll get you started with some LED light bulbs and a couple of things, it's completely free. So that's a good place to start. They also have a lot of rebates. So if you are looking to change out an appliance, there's often some rebates 
and there's tons. I just pulled out the ones for the refrigerator and the dehumidifier. If they're Energy Star certified, they'll give you some money. So that's a really great way to just get started and, and uh, it's free. Next, we'll look at renewable energy. So renewable energy is really crucial for achieving that net zero. It's actually kind of, it is impossible to be net zero unless you're able to switch to renewable because that's gonna be a large chunk of your carbon footprint. And uh, renewable energy is a way to reduce that. And it's also really important when it comes to kind of transitioning as a country to sustainable energy systems. This is something you can do directly with your provider, which I'll show you in a moment. Now, this is more if you own your home. You might not have control over this if you're leasing your home uh, or renting your home. So one thing that, and I'm happy to offer additional thoughts on this, but one thing that I have helped businesses do is have conversations with their landlord about switching to a renewable energy source. So while they can't have that choice themselves, there's kind of conversation starters that you can have, uh, or even if you're living in an apartment building, getting a few people together to kind of put a little petition to say, hey, we would love if our electricity could come from a, a renewable source. And when we talk about renewable, it's solar, wind, or small scale hydro. So even if you are renting your home, there's still kind of a, a, a way that you can at least start the conversation. So practically, what does this look like? This is really neat. Um, my husband did this for our own electricity for us to switch. Uh, this is a website called PA Power Switch. The QR code's there. Uh, you put in your zip code and it will tell you what your options are in your location for um, an energy provider. So MedEd and PPL are your distributors, but you can choose where your, your electricity is coming from. I don't know if everyone knows that. So you actually have a say and can kind of shop around. You can shop around and just pick a cheaper option, but you'll see here that there is a place that you can check renewable energy when you're searching, and it will give you lots of options for uh, companies that you can switch to. It's really easy. You're still getting your bills from PPL, but the source of that is different. So you can pick ones that are 100% renewable. Uh, I like doing research on companies. So there's a lot of options out there, so you can kind of read about them before making your decision and uh, just keep your eye out for the type of renewable energy. Um, Large-scale hydro and small-scale hydro are quite different. Small-scale hydro is definitely the better option, although large-scale hydro is, is better than traditional. So you can read about that and pick, but it's quite easy to do. And um, cost-wise, it's often very comparable, maybe a couple more cents but it's not a huge difference. Okay, so that's a little bit about your home. And now let's talk about, I think the more challenging one to change, which is personal life carbon footprint. So these uh, relate to our daily activities, the products we use, the activities we engage in, uh, the clothing we wear, and also what we're eating, our food and diet. As you saw, earlier in that image, food and agriculture does play a major role in greenhouse gas emissions. But both of these do require a bit of behavior change and lifestyle change. And uh, like I like to say, uh, household culture change, <laughs> if you're living with other people. So this is kind of more challenging, but can make a huge difference when it comes to our personal footprint. So we're going to start with talking about transportation. So based on what you know now about greenhouse gas emissions, you know that cars, planes, they put a lot of emissions into the atmosphere. So as much as we can rely on public transit, carpooling, biking or walking, and reducing our use of cars is really important. If we do need to drive or have a car, which many of us do, our public transit in the US is not necessarily uh, set up in a way that prevents us from needing that. But it is better if you are in the market for a new car to think of the fuel efficiency, the miles per gallon. Um, if you can think about hybrid or electric, that can make a big difference. And as I said, when you are completing that calculator, it will ask you about that. So if you can get more miles per gallon, um, that will decrease your carbon. This other one is really simple, but just combining trips. So if you gotta go to the library, and the grocery store, like try to do it at the same time. So you're not 
uh, having to make two separate trips. I work from home, so telecommuting is just what I do. Not everyone has that uh, ability. And I will say working from home will slightly increase your home emissions. So keep that in mind because you're probably using a more electricity. But overall, that means you are using your car less. And if you think about it, if you have a meeting with, say, 10 people and they're all driving their car to the office, you know, can you do that remotely? That's saving 10 cars from getting out on the road. And then this one, honestly, I struggle with this one because I like to travel. But flying is such a big uh, carbon footprint. So uh, some of us have family. Some of us like to travel. So this is a huge lifestyle shift. But when we do fly, there are better airlines than others when it comes to how eco-friendly they are. And there's some things we can keep in mind around how we're flying. So I've never flown business class. But if you're someone who has that option or you have the what more room you have on the plane, the bigger your footprint will be for taking that plane. The more luggage you have, the more space you're taking up. So if you do have to fly, fly economy. There's one positive, I guess, to having little leg room is your carbon footprint is lower. So you can think of it that way. Uh, the other thing that I have some friends who do this, they set carbon budgets for themselves for travel. So they might say, uh, they might limit it to number of trips or number of miles, or they there's resources out there you can just plug in where you're going and it will tell you your carbon footprint for that trip. Um, and they set a budget and when they hit the budget, they hit the budget for the year. So you have to be really thoughtful of what trips you take. So practically, there's a really cool website called Alternative Airlines. Uh, this is a screenshot of it. You can put, if you have to fly, you can put where you're leaving from, where you're going, when you're going, and it will give you the, the most eco-friendly option for that trip. So it will give you the best airline. It will also give you the route that has the lowest carbon. So sometimes it's cheaper to have those trips where you're like randomly stopping in Detroit when you're going to Florida, if you've ever been on those types of flights where they kind of take you all around. Um, but those actually have a much, much higher carbon footprint because a lot of the greenhouse gas that are emitted is happening when you're taking off in the plane. So if you're having to do that more than once for a trip, it's really increasing the carbon. So this will help you kind of plan a route that has the lowest footprint. Next is diet, another challenging one. Uh, so we know that agriculture and food and even packaging of our food plays a big role with our footprint. Animal products, especially beef and lamb, have high emissions and plant-based foods generally have lower emissions. So when you have the choice, eating less meat and dairy is a much better option and uh, local and seasonal food. Because you have, to, you know, thinking about the scopes, it's how it gets to you and that is is it coming from California or is it coming from Hellertown? You know, so if you can choose local and seasonal foods, that's going to cut down on the emissions it took to get to you. Um, I think we mentioned this in the beginning, but or maybe we didn't, but just to be on the lookout for in February, we're going to have another webinar and it's going to be focused on plant based eating. So if this is of interest to you and you want to kind of dig into this, I'd encourage you to keep your eye out um, on the library and the co-op site because that would be a great webinar to, to join. Practically, there's, again, tons of resources around reducing our emissions for diet. I just have two that I really like. Uh, the first here is a seasonal food guide. This is where you can put in where you live, the month, and what kind of produce, produce you're looking for, and it will tell you what is in season. So when you are going to the grocery store, you have tons of options. It's not always evident where that food's coming from. So you can try to be choosing the foods that are in season. Um, the co-op will be in place next year and that will be a lot easier for us to be able to probably identify where the food's coming from and, and focus on this, which will be great. Uh, to the right, I have just a couple like meat alternative options. Um, 
again, some of these you might, depending on your journey, you might be very uh, familiar with. And I encourage you to put in the chat if you have some other meat alternatives that you um, can think of. But I can share that mushrooms can make a really good, um, can be a really good substitute for like ground beef and tacos. And one of my favorites, which I have been secretly doing, is buffalo chicken dip is you know I, I don't know about you but for my family and friends that's a popular holiday party item and I've been replacing the chicken with riced cauliflower and I don't even tell people I just say unless it's in a group where I know some people are vegetarian I just say it's buffalo chicken dip and I don't think people know the difference in my family because I don't think they'd eat it if they if they knew it was cauliflower necessarily so there's little tips like that where um, it's just as good. So that's something to be mindful of. And then our last category here is about waste. So uh, this is where we get into the downstream, what happens to things after we use it. And this is really important because waste contributes to methane emissions specifically. Uh, so there's a lot of benefits to choosing products that have minimum packaging reducing food waste or any kind of waste that we have. Specifically with packaging, uh, you know, I'm sure you know when you go to the grocery store, there's a lot of stuff in plastic. So, you know, when choosing apples, if you can get the single apples rather than the bag, that's one less plastic bag you have to throw away. Um, when it comes to cleaning products, paper products, there's a lot of um, alternatives so that you don't have to use single use products. I wanna give a shout out to, we actually are really lucky in the Lehigh Valley. We have two zero waste stores that are really helpful when thinking of making the switch from some of our single use products. So um, Verde, which is in Bethlehem and FD Market, which is in the promenade shops in Saucon Valley. Both of those have um, personal products and cleaning products in bulk. So you can bring a jar and fill it up with laundry detergent uh, or shampoo or hand soap, or you can bring nice glass bottles that you use and you pay by the ounce. And I do that for a lot of what I have. And I can tell you the price is pretty comparable. It's pretty this much of the same if you look at it and break it down. Um, and the co-op, I think will have bulk food options. So being able to maybe fill up with your oats or your flour rather than buying a single pack every time. So we do have some options here for that. And then uh, when you do have waste and you can't reduce it, compost, recycle, upcycle, reuse it, all of that can help reduce overall emissions. And then finally, just to mention that conscious pur purchasing and consumption is really important. As I said in the beginning, anytime we buy something, we're voting with our dollar. We're supporting whatever that product or business is. So when we have the option of choosing products, you know, you can keep your eye out for certain certifications like the B Corp certification or FFC certification, which looks at the um, percentage of compostable or um, recycled input material. So there's lots of tools out there to help you make conscious purchasing decisions. And local is, of course, a really kind of great criteria for you. What that looks like in practice, uh, on the left-hand side is just like a sample of what your cleaning uh, cabinet could look like. So you have a nice glass spray bottle that's reusable. Um, what I would do and what I do is I have a concentrate that I pour in there and then I fill it with water and I just reuse that. And they have like any kind of cleaning you would need for tile or for multi-purpose or whatever. You can bring any kind of jar or container in and fill it up with laundry detergent or shampoo or soap. Uh, I have a big glass jar where I put my laundry detergent in. And then there's lots of products, you've probably seen them, that on the right there, that have compostable kind of bristles and sponges. And when you need to dispose of it, you can compost it. And then when you're buying a new one, you're not buying a whole new product, you're just replacing that head. So there's lots of options like that. And then to the right are just some ideas on how to reduce your food waste. Um, like I said, we're going to have more ways to learn about that in our next webinar. But one of my favorite ones is uh, freezing, understanding how to store your food. 
Like it's pretty amazing if you uh, can know how to store certain vegetables and fruits, they last so much longer. So there's tons of resource out there to, to better understand that. So again, this is, that's a lot. It's, we have a short amount of time. Um, hopefully some of that maybe piqued your interest of something you think you could, you could start to do. So now I have it's go time. Um, time for action is now. And I know that it's almost 8 p.m. on a Tuesday night. So you're probably not necessarily in the mood to make some big commitments. But what I would love for us to just think about today is, is there one thing that maybe I shared with you that you think you could try doing or have a conversation with someone in your household about? So as a recap, um, there's lots of options. And actually, I would love in the chat if anyone wants to say, hey, I'm going to try doing this, like tell us in the chat a little bit of accountability. Uh, but I'll just do a quick recap. So one could be focusing on energy efficiency. Maybe you're committing to ch changing your light bulbs. Uh, you know you need a new fridge. You're going to commit to getting an Energy Star one. Two is renewable energy. This would be a huge, like a huge way to help your carbon footprint and decrease it. So maybe you're committing to doing some research and thinking about switching. Uh, three, thinking about how you use your car, if you have a car, or how you can reduce your use or increase walking, um, or maybe you set yourself a carbon budget if you're someone who likes to, to travel. Uh, four, the, that plant-based diet. This can be hard, especially if you live with people who aren't on board. So, you know, even if you're starting small, like Meatless Monday, or, you know, you gradually are just going to pick certain meals to, to replace a meat item that's like a good place to start five think about your waste reduction uh, I like just having the challenge of like look around your kitchen and pick one thing that's in a plastic bottle that you think you could maybe replace with with something that is not single use so just you can start small and then the sixth is if you're someone who really likes accountability maybe sign up for one of the challenges there's a lot of challenges out there the Bethlehem climate challenge uh, there's also food prints reduction challenge that Kathy um, pointed me to, and that's a really great one if you want to focus more on the food waste. Uh, so I'd encourage you to pick one or think about one. And, you know, if anyone wants to share in the chat, I um, was reflecting a little bit on this myself. And I, um, I would like to focus on number three a little bit more. We actually have two cars and we don't probably need two cars. Um, so I would like to think about maybe getting rid of one. I think my husband's on the call, so that would be an interesting conversation later. Uh, or just thinking about how we can maybe walk more. Uh, so that's that's what I wanna think about, or that carbon budget, because I am someone who likes to travel. Um, cool, so let me just show a couple of things, then we're gonna do questions and any sharing, but feel free to continue to share in the chat. Um, I'm not going to go over this, but I just want to tell you that there's so many more resources out there about these topic, these topics. Um, these are some of my favorite books, articles, websites, and if you're into academic research, it's there for you. So we'll share this afterwards, and uh, there's a lot more than this, but this could just be a, a way to dig in a bit deeper if you're interested. And with that, we have about eight to ten minutes left, so. Um, I see there's a question in the chat, so I'll start with that one. But I just want to say thank you. I know that was a lot in a short amount of time, but I hope you heard something that maybe sparked your interest. And um, I'd love to take any questions or I know there's a lot of people on here that are already doing a lot in this category. So if you want to share a favorite resource or something you're already doing with this group to benefit from, we can open that up now as well. But let me start with some questions with uh, Kathy. So um, she has some trips planned this year, three flights planned, and she would like to carbon offset them. Uh, so